Hi everyone, greetings from a GMT plus two time zone, Cairo, Egypt. The weather now is around 28 degrees, which is somehow warm, although we are in November and supposedly this is winter in Egypt and let's say hi to global warming and you've been a guest for British Council for quite some time for now. My name is Karim Halmi and let me tell you a story. In 2010, I had a friend who told me, Karim, there is this competition or an event called Fame Lab, and you get to go on stage, talk about science, talk about science communication, and you might as well win a trip to the UK. So I told myself, mm, well, I really like public speaking and I like even more traveling, so why not? Why take it, uh, not to, to try and take uh, a shot? So I did my first ever Fame Lab talk, which was about this strange new technology by then in movie production and Egyptian theaters called 3D cinemas. Now, definitely, this is totally normal. So I came to Cheltenham as a runner-up, though I didn't win the competition here in Egypt, but I thank my friend every time I meet her since then. At Cheltenham, I met a great MC, and he was very inspiring for me. He was called Matt Parker. And I asked back then, British Council team, that I want to host next year's Fame Lab event at Cheltenham. And for so many reasons, that was not possible by then. But they told me we can give you the chance to host the national competition in Egypt. So here I am today, and I guess I'm achieving what I dreamt of exactly 10 years ago. And let me please take a moment here and give a tribute to a person who first had confidence in me to give me the chance of hosting the national um, fame lab competitions in Egypt 10 years ago. This person maybe left our world, but she remains in our thoughts and our prayers. And this person is Rima Oud. I wouldn't hide how much I wanted now to be on stage in Cheltenham, like physically being there, but it's fine. Uh, I'm also like putting a lot of pictures for Cheltenham on my desktop right now, so I can be in the mood as well. So here I am, proud to welcome you all to the Fame Lab International Semi-Finals for 2021. This is the second semi-final, then we will head to the big event, the finals. Fame Lab is organized by the Cheltenham Festival in partnership with the Bridge Council. If you've not came across to Bridge Council before, it's the UK's international organization for culture, uh, cultural relations and educational opportunities. Today, we are collecting great minds from 12 different countries. And um, where there is a slight, just a slight time zone difference happened only a nine hours difference between Australia and Spain, for instance. And for that, this session is pre-recorded. But the good news is the chat is live. So please feel free and we are actually encouraging you to use uh, the text, the, uh, to react, to comment, to try and meet other attendees and for sure make some written virtual noise uh, encouraging every participant. So as a starter, uh, let us know where you're attending from and you might as well share with us like an interesting fact about your uh, area of the world or about your culture. Um, I guess I will accept also local food and dish recommendations uh, as well. That would be great uh, uh, to come up with. So let's know more now about Fame Lab, what's all about, uh, the rules. Here's ev everything that you will need to know in the coming video. FameLab is the leading science communication competition and training program in the world. Each year, thousands of researchers from across the globe receive training and then compete in heats. FameLab was created by Cheltenham Science Festival and is delivered globally in partnership with the British Council, making science accessible for all. FameLabbers have three minutes to capture their audience. Three judges judge them on the three C's of FameLab. Content, clarity, and charisma. And you, the audience, vote for your favorite too. Each country crowns their national champion, and those national champions come together to compete for the title of FameLab International Champion. 
FameLab participants have gone on to present TV shows, give TED Talks, publish books, and so much more. FameLab is all about giving skills, confidence, and opportunities to scientists, engineers, and mathematicians to communicate their current research with the people that it impacts. Yes, FameLab is an international competition where the most talented science communicators are rising and shining. Those participants took part in countless regional heats and national finals right around the world. The finalists in each country attended a masterclass to improve their skills further before heading to the country final. And the country champions had even more training before performing in today's semi-final. So we are expecting today a lot of creativity and a lot of talent as well. Now down to 23 country champions, but only 10 will go through to the final. Five from each semi-final, four chosen by, by our three judges, which is a tough decision to be honest, and one chosen by you, the audience. But we will come to more on that later a little bit. Yesterday was the first awesome semi-final. Today we will feature the 12 remaining semi-finalists representing their countries. For most, if not all of the participants, English is their second language, which is totally fine, and language is not one of the judging criteria. It might be challenging, yes, but you know, comfort zone, we usually say no to that in Flame Lab. So now, since we are talking about judging, I guess it's the perfect time to get to know your awesome three judges for today. So let's meet our first judge. Dara, welcome. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you will be looking for today. Thanks for having me. So my name is Dara. I work as the Senior Manager for Astronomy Education at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Uh, I'm absolutely looking forward to today. I'm really looking forward to being inspired by some of the participants. Uh, getting to learn something new, seeing their personalities shine through and just being really interested in their topic, leaving me wanting to find out more. Thank you so much, uh, Dara. I'm pretty much sure that you will be uh, uh, fascinated today and you will see some really interesting talks. So uh, thank you for that. Moving on, let me introduce Shini. Please tell us about yourself and uh, also what you'll be looking for today. Hi, Kareem and hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Shini Somara and I am originally a mechanical engineer and now I'm a broadcaster, children's book author, podcaster, definitely in media for science and technology. So as a judge, I'm looking for how people are able to translate their interest and expertise in science into something that we can all access. As Einstein said, if you can't put it simply enough, then you don't understand it well enough, something along those lines. And so I'm really looking for that translation that's most important for me today. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Shini. I really like the word tra translation. I wish I heard it like before. I, I might use it in a lot of occasions, but yeah, I would agree on that. Thank you so much for being here with us and moving to our final name in the jury, pa jury panel for today. Andrew, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Andrew Steele. I'm a scientist, a presenter and an author. I've just released my first book, which is called Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. And what will I be looking for today? I think the thing that really impassions me, and I'm actually a former fame lover myself from way back in 2012, if anyone, uh, anyone was even born then. What I really found challenging when I did Fame Lab was coming up with the content. It's finding the, the sort of topic that you can convey in those three minutes. I wrote far, far more talks than I actually delivered. So I just really want to see how the contestants have picked out their topic to create something that you can convey in that time and generate some real excitement with that incredibly tight constraint that Fame Lab provides. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And let me just uh, express how much I love the setup at your side with the virtual background. I feel like we are broadcasting with a TV uh, presenter, live broadcasting. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for being uh, with us. So if you allow me to go back to Dara, and um, I want to ask you a question about the three C's, because when we say the word three C's, uh, 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 content, clarity, charisma, what does this exactly mean to you? So these are the things that obviously as judges we'll be looking at. So content, you know, you want to have topics that people are conveying that are of interest, that are presented, um, you know, to an audience that they can grasp it in some way. Um, that the content is delivered as a journey or a narrative to, to really bring us into the story or the connection of why participants find 
uh, their topic particularly interesting. Uh, in terms of clarity, of course, we want it to be um, understandable uh, and something that can relate uh, to our everyday lives or something that we can relate to ourselves as well. And then uh, the last one about charisma, always the tricky one, I guess. But um, I think what we'll be looking at, or at least what I'll be looking at, is whether uh, participants can sort of bring their personality into their presentations, you know, whether they are live and bubbly or whether they're, they're a little bit more quiet. I want to be able to understand who they are through the presentations that they give. That's great. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dora. So back to uh, Xin as well. We have spoken about language and how do you see having contestants from all over the world where English might be their second language? Well, this is going to be a really interesting one for me today because science is global. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing people's passion about their topic. And, you know, that passion can come out whether English is your first, second, third language. It's, it's really, it's something that transcends all kind of language barriers. So I guess that comes into the charisma uh, category. Um, I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for um, real sort of understanding of their topic. And I'm also really looking forward to learning about diverse subjects within STEM. And so language shouldn't be an issue. Um, it's, it's qualities that are beyond language that I'm looking for today. Thank you for emphasizing about that, Chini. And moving back to uh, Andrew, so charisma is usually a tricky concept to understand and more tricky to actually judge. So how do you see it? It is very hard and I think the sort of the irony of the mo most of the things we're looking for in this you know, very scientific competition are sort of quantifiable. You know, the content, the clarity, you can judge on fairly objective criteria, but the charisma it's just a sort of a certain something. And I think um, it, it transcends both the content and the clarity. It's almost as though you could, you, know, you could give someone else's talk or maybe even you could be reading the phone book. But your personality just shines through in such a way as I don't want you to stop talking because three minutes isn't very long. So you know, if, if, they, if they leave me wanting more, I think that'll get a big thumbs up from me in terms of the charisma. That's a very nice uh, illustration and, uh, and a nice example. So thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And thank you for our three fantastic judges who will definitely have a tough job uh, today. But also for all of, the, of you, the audience, the judges don't hold all of the power because you get to vote your favorite through to the final two. Uh, good news for the audience and I guess for the participants as well, uh, because you might be able to change the way the final will go by choosing to give your vote to the participant that you feel or think they deserve to be at the final. Uh, when all the participants will have spoken and ended their talks, the audience vote will open for 24 hours. You can follow the link on the screen or on the chat, and I would encourage you to try and not to vote to your friends. I know it's a little bit difficult, I want my friend to win and go to the final, but I mean, try to vote for the participant that, participant that you think really deserves a spot in the finals. And that would be awesome if, by coincidence, it happens to be your friend as well. So uh, I would encourage you to focus on all of the talks, keep uh, with us till the end and uh, vote for your favorite participant. And now, moving on to the interesting part of the day, meeting the stars, the participants. And let me start with the first participant. She's an explorer and she's the youngest participant selected for the all-women expedition to the Antarctica in 2018. Uh, with a PhD in biomedical science and working as a postdoctoral research officer at the Institute of Molecular Bioscience, the, the University of Queensland, let us please give the warmest welcome to our, our first contestant in the semi-finals today, Samantha from Australia. You may have heard that everything in Australia is trying to kill you. We have crocodiles, sharks, snakes, spiders and more. And our reputation is a little bit exaggerated. But one animal that's not messing around is this guy. This is the closest you should ever come to the world's deadliest spider, the Australian funnel web. 
Funnel web bites cause extreme pain, muscle convulsions, dangerously high blood pressure, and respiratory paralysis, which can be fatal. But these deadly, beautiful spiders could hold the key to life-saving medicines. I'm a former arachnophobe turned venom scientist. I study Australian funnel webs because they have the most complex venom on the planet with over 3000 toxins. But the deadly effects of the venom come from just one toxin. So what are all those other thousands of toxins doing? My research aims to find these toxins, understand how they work, and then see if we can use them in medicine. But first, I have to find the funnel webs. They live deep underground, hidden away in burrows. And after lots of careful experimenting, I found the best way to dig them up is a spaghetti spoon. The teeth allow me to dig through the dirt and through the roots, and the spoon is gentle enough that I don't hurt the spider. Then I have to collect the venom. Funnel webs uniquely drip venom from their fangs in threat display. So I have to tap the legs of the spider with tweezers so that it rears up and strikes. Then I get a pipette and suck the tiny droplets of venom off the fangs between strikes. Now that I have the venom, I can study those toxins. And it turns out that the majority of them are not deadly to us. They can actually help us. Many of them help the spider to catch their insect prey. So we harness this to develop an eco-friendly, commercially available insecticide. Most excitingly, we're focusing on a peptide called HI1A. HI1A shows great promise for treating stroke. It reduces the size of the stroke by up to 70%. HI1A works by surprisingly protecting our cells from the damage caused by a lack of oxygen. We call this condition ischemia. So we decided to apply HI1A to other ischemic diseases. And we found that it can also protect heart cells after a heart attack. This is important because ischemic heart disease and stroke are the number one and two leading causes of death worldwide, killing over 15 million people last year. So Australia may be famous for their deadly venoms, but we may also hold the key to the world's most critically important life-saving medicines. That's, that's a great talk. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Samantha, and a great start for the day. Uh, so moving on to the questions uh, with the judges. So uh, Dara, uh, you have the floor. So thank you so much for that, Samantha. Um, a very interesting topic, and I think, like you, um, I'm also a fellow, or was uh, a fellow arachnophobe. Um, I think it's interesting that you use the spider at the beginning as a prop. I just wonder what you think, um, you know, people might think about spiders having now kind of understood a bit more about the research and what spiders could potentially do um, for kind of medical benefits. Well, my ultimate goal is to actually sort of subvert that stereotype that everything in Australia is trying to kill us and help people learn to appreciate how amazing our spiders are. You know, Australia has some of the most incredible biodiversity, particularly of venomous animals, and they're basically nature's um, pharmacies. They have been filled with thousands of compounds that actually have a lot of drug-like properties. And it turns out that even the deadliest spiders and snakes on the planet could actually be saving lives one day. So I hope it helps convince people not to squish the spiders, but to just appreciate them in nature. Uh, thank you, uh, Samantha and Dara for the questions. Um, moving to Shini. Hi, Samantha. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, it's clear that, you know, spiders have lots of benefits for us. Um, I just wondered how is our little eight-legged furry friend feeling in that container? Yes, um, good question. This is not her, she wouldn't normally be in this container. This is just for today's show. Normally she lives in a beautiful palace of a tank uh, filled with lots of dirt and ferns. Um, she builds a beautiful burrow and then she gets fed crickets on demand in exchange for a couple of drops of venom every two months. And she can actually live for 25 years. So she's pretty much set for life. 
So thank you for your service today. This is actually Colossus, by the way. I didn't introduce her. Uh, she's from um, Queensland, just like I am. Uh, and after this, she'll go back into her home. Uh, great, thank you so much. Uh, I guess we still have time for a quick uh, question from Andrew. Yeah, I just was wondering, um, it seems like woefully inefficient to have 3,000 different chemicals inside this venom. So obviously, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, they must all be doing something. And in particular, this one that's uh, useful for ischemia you mentioned, what's it actually doing? Is it, is it normally used when the spider bites into an insect? Because presumably the spider isn't hoping to kill its human prey, but also prevent it from having a stroke. So, you know, what's going on there? Why are there so many chemicals and what do they all do? Not individually. Um, fantastic question. That's basically my research question. Um, why have such complex venoms? Um, and it's actually a bit of a quirk of evolution. So a lot of these toxins, they didn't evolve to, um, you know, kill us. Funnel web spiders were here for 150 million years before we were. Um, and so what we think actually happens with this toxin that's protecting from ischemia is that it actually has the opposite effect in birds uh, which are a predator of the funnel webs uh, but it's just a quirk of our different sort of physiology that it's actually helping to protect humans. That's totally bizarre and fascinating thank you. Thank you so much uh, Samantha and thank you so much for all of the uh, judges and the questions that was a super start for the day. And let's, let's continue meeting another star uh, who saw himself as a curious kid collecting everything that he would fit in his tiny pockets. His love to nature and to uh, living uh, uh, bodies led him to finish a PhD in biophysics. He loves outdoor adventures till now, doing archery and rock climbing, and he's from a totally other continent than Australia, so let's now travel to Europe specifically Germany, and give the warmest welcome to Stefan. Stefan, you have the floor. Hey everyone, I'm Stefan, and I forgot my headphones. Ugh. One sec. Ah, here we go. Oh no. Ugh. Okay. Are you familiar with this problem? Well, I think we all are, whether we quickly, quickly needed uh, our headphones for our next online meeting, or we're fighting with last year's Christmas decoration, we all know that long cables tend to become badly entangled. But then, have you ever wondered why your DNA doesn't end up like this? Because your DNA is a very long molecule that contains all the instructions to build a new human. Yet the problem is that these instructions are not written page by page as the assembly instructions at your favorite furniture store, but in your DNA these are written letter after letter, all in one line, and for that reason your DNA is very, very long. It is so long that your cells have to store it inside a container called the nucleus. And if I was a cell and my nucleus the size of my backpack, I would have to pack 500 kilometers of DNA into here without making knots or tangles. Because knots and tangles in your DNA are pretty bad and it's easy to see why. If I'm still a cell, I want to divide. And for that, I have to duplicate my DNA and give one copy to each of my daughter cells. But if my DNA looks like this, here's what happens. Well, it breaks, damaging or destroying the instructions, which is why broken DNA is often associated with diseases such as cancer. So now, how does our DNA stay organized? And that's exactly the question I asked myself during my PhD. But as much as I would have loved to peek inside the nucleus to see what's going on, even our best microscopes couldn't show as much because there's just so much DNA densely packed in here. So here's what I did. I cut out single pieces of DNA and put them on a glass surface so I could observe them. And suddenly I could see what's going on. I saw ring-shaped proteins binding to the DNA and pulling it into loops like tiny machines. And it turns out, as this happens everywhere on your DNA, these loops prevent your DNA from getting entangled. So even in this very moment, 
There is an army of tiny biological machines inside of you organizing your DNA and preventing it from ending up like my earphone cords. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, uh, Stefan. That was uh, awesome. I wish I have the same technique with my cables around me and all of that mess. Uh, but thank you for that. And let's go for the judges for the questions. So starting this time with Andrew. I was just wondering, you know, there's this 500 kilometers of DNA inside your bag or whatever. How do those proteins know where it is that they're supposed to stick and how many different kinds are there and how, how many of them are there? Can you just sort of give a sense of how complicated a job this is? <laughs> well, that's an ongoing question. Um, you, want to, you want to do a PhD here? That's exactly what we're trying to figure out. And decades of researchers have tried to figure out. And there's not only this one ring-shaped machine that I showed that is organizing your DNA. And as you mentioned, there's a whole armada of proteins working your DNA, constantly repairing it, or as I showed, duplicating it with precisions that could write the entire Wikipedia without making a mistake. Um, so highly sophisticated machines that we just come to grasp to understand are constantly working, organizing, repairing, uh, and of course reading and interpreting our DNA. And um, understanding like the whole magnitude and complexity of this is, uh, is one of the big challenges uh, and missions of, of biological science these days. So I'm afraid I can give you, uh, well, a full answer to your question, but I guess this is uh, as far as, as, as we are. It might take more than three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, it might, it might need an extension for that or another talk. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew, for your question. And moving to Dara, if you have a question to Stefan. Absolutely. So fantastic presentation. Um, you talked about this idea that, you know, when you have entangled DNA, uh, when it tries to replicate, it can break and that can cause things like cancers. Can you just explain perhaps that process or, you know, what do you mean by the fact that it can cause cancers or how? And are there any other things, any other kind of negative impacts of this DNA replicating in a way that you might not want it to? Um, yes, exactly. So... You have to imagine when you replicate your DNA, you have actually double the amount of cables, if you will, that you have to untangle because you have to give the right amount and also the right kind to each of your daughter cells. Now, it's been often observed that if there are tangles in your DNA, it breaks and then these broken pieces either float around and form something that's called a micronucleus um, or that one cell gets most of the DNA and the other one is lacking a lot of the essential parts and this can, can cause diseases and um, a common screening for cancer cells actually is to look for these micronuclei or multinuclei and so on but of course these also have, have other reasons but um, the whole DNA repair mechanism is heavily studied, especially in um, the cancer treatment um, field. Thank you so much, Stefan, for uh, uh, your answer. We have just uh, maybe a minute left. If you have, Shini, if you have a quick question to Stefan. Stefan, brilliant presentation, amazing use of props. What I'd like to know is the research that you're doing, do you know if it has applications in a more sort of engineering context, as in, are there solutions to detangling actual cables? <laughs> well, um, the thing is that there are these things called cable organizers that are actually in heavy use in this building. Um, and actually what you do is you put your cables into uh, an array of, of loops. So uh, it seems like we've accomplished an engineer engineering task, but uh, apparently nature was first um, because also these uh, proteins that we've uh, studied here, these ring shaped proteins, they are super ancient. So they're not, not, uh, not only doing this job in you, but in every living creature down to bacteria on this earth. So um, as far as applications go, well, we do basic research, but understanding how things work can either then lead to, to treatments or um, a further understanding of, uh, well, how life basically works. 
Thank you so much, uh, Shini and the judges. Thank you as well, uh, Stefan. And with that in mind, Nature did it first. Uh, let me uh, jump to the next uh, participant. And to be honest, um, I'm in love with how diverse in terms of cultures, countries, this event is. Uh, because now we are traveling to a third continent, Asia this time. And the next participant has his PhD in Life Sciences from Imperial College in London in 2019. And now he's a lecturer uh, at Prince of Songkla University in the Taos of Thailand. His specialty is bioinformatics, uh, which is about using uh, computers to solve biological problems. He's also enjoying doing educational videos and posting it online. So I would like, please, to welcome Sirawit. If I said to you that these two pens are almost identical but with just 0.1% difference and I asked you to pick one, which one would you choose? Maybe you wouldn't mind at all as long as they both can do the job and the difference appears to be negligible. But in some situations, a negligible difference can lead to a tremendous impact worldwide and that is happening to us right now. Welcome to the world of human DNA the genetic material that dictates how to build, operate, or maintain our bodies. The study of human DNA has been a formidable challenge for many decades because we are a large, complex organism which makes it extremely difficult to study when compared to other small species. Until recently, advances in computer technology allowed us to collect and analyze DNA from humans from populations across the globe to find out the genetic variation that make us different from one another. Remarkably, what scientists have found is that if you compare your DNA to the DNA of any random person on the street, you'll be surprised to know that the difference will be just about 0.1%. But that difference is what makes every one of us unique and special. Genetic variation can give us different appearances, skin colors, or even serious health conditions like the sickle cell disease. The genetic disorder that severely affects about 300,000 newborn babies each year. This disease is caused by just a single error in the DNA, resulting in the abnormal shape of the red blood cell, hampering the ability to carry the oxygen. Realizing this, scientists have tried so hard to find a way to cure and to prevent the passing of the defect genes from parents to their children. Another benefit of knowing the genetic variations is that it allows doctors to come up with a personalized medicine for each individual. Because a drug that works well in one person might not do the same job for another, so the doctors may have to adjust the dosage or change the drug according to the patient's DNA for the best treatment. It's amazing, right, that such small differences in our DNA could lead to very great scientific you know, innovation and discovery. Sadly, that's still one problem that hasn't been resolved. In many parts of the world, many people are victims of hate crimes. Just because they're black, they're Asian, or just because they from the ethnic minority groups. Many people are judged, devalued, or bullied only because they look different from other people from the outside. Most differences that we see are controlled by nothing but the 0.1% of our DNA. Everyone deserves to be respected. So as we celebrate science, let's not forget to also celebrate diversity and promote inclusivity because eventually, we all are the same human beings with the same heart. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sirawit. That is um, a very nice message by the end of your talk. Uh, I would like also to express that I really like your, your nickname, Ice. So, uh, um, so yeah, so jumping to the judges and if you have questions and let me start with Shini. That was a fantastic and very powerful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious to know, are you specializing in sickle cell? And if so, where are you with your research? Well, my specialty is not about the sickle cell. My specialty is about bioinformatics, which is about you know, uh, programming, using computer technology, analyzing human DNAs. But the sickle cell here that I picked is just one of the example that we can get you know, when you know more about your DNA, you can get to know what's happening in terms of the DNA. And then when it's translated to the protein, what's happening in terms of that? Sickle cell is just the result of a single error. And that could lead to like a tremendous impact 
and you know it happens to lots of people in the world as well. I'm not a special you know, a specialist in sickle cells, but this is what I know so far. Thank you. Thank you, Shini, and moving to Andrew. Hello, yeah, I thought that was a really great overview and I was just wondering, do you have like a favorite personalized medicine to sort of give an example and drill down into a bit more specifically of how that technology actually works? My favorite personalized medicine, currently I don't have any, but the concept of personalized medicine is that, you know, because people are different in terms of their genes and that means you, the doctors may have to uh, create, you know, uh, the drugs that can be effective to each individual. The concept of personalized medicine is still a pioneer in many you know, medical university, medical school, also in Thailand as well. This is still you know, not very prevailing. Not, uh, you can't really find this kind of you know, technology uh, in all the hospital. It's only specific to uh, some medical school, some advanced medical school. But the thing is, we have to collect lots of the DNA samples, DNA, you know, the genetic information from lots of patients so that we can determine you know, what we can do with each of them. And rather than using medicine, what do you think of the idea of going in and actually changing people's genes to try and make them better? Well, changing, you know, p changing people's gene is something that might be um, beyond our ability right now. But, you know, with the genetic technology, well, there's been like an idea that in the future we might be able to do some kind of genetic engineering in terms of human. But then there's a problem, you know, with the ethical issues that's still in debating right now. So... Finger cross. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you, uh, Sirawit. Moving to Dara, if you have a final question for Sirawit. Yeah, first of all, uh, a lovely presentation, and I like the emotional message that you had in, in, in that talk as well. Um, maybe just a quick question about the future. You talked about personalized medicine. How likely do you think this research will inevitably uh, bring us to personalized medicine? Well, I surely I'm looking forward to seeing personal like, medicine in like probably in just a, like next decade because you know um, this this kind of project starts from you know uh, the human genome project with you know people try to collect the DNA sequences from you know their populations and even in the UK they have the project which is called the uh, 100,000 K project is right the 100 K project which aims to sequence you know, um, the DNA sequences from patients from the NHS hospital, and they have, you know, the databases to determine um, about which drugs is good for which kind of DNA. And that means if you go to the hospital in the future and you have your DNA tested, you know your genetic variations, doctors can also use that kind of information to determine which drug works best for you as well. This kind of project is also happening right now in Thailand as well, my home country. We are establishing what is called the Genomics Thailand. We aim to get the DNA sequences from about like 50,000 patients to find out the genetic variations in Thai you know, populations. And then that is going to come up with a personalized medicine for Thai people as well. So I believe that in the future, probably like five years or 10 years, this is going to be worldwide and this is going to revolutionize the way that we treat patients. Thank you. Fingers crossed, as you said. Fingers crossed uh, again. Yeah, exactly. Fingers crossed, as you said, Sirawit, and or I may use your your nickname. So thank you so much, Ice. Thank you so much, judges. And now uh, let's move for the next uh, participant. So you know what? I'll, I'll probably stop counting how many continents we reached so far because that would be so many. But you will notice anyway. The next participant is a 22-year-old food science and technology student at the University um, uh, of Mauritius, Africa. Her research focuses on giving value to local underutilized edible crops. Her goal is to connect people actually to wholesome foods by educating them on which products are truly healthy. Outside of her, of her research, you can, you can find her practicing some sort of dance, which is called Bharatnatyam, which is a major form of Indian classical dance that originated in modern, modern day region of Tamil Nadu. Over to you right now and please welcome Pooja from Mauritius. Imagine the last time you experienced hunger or walk into your refrigerator and it is completely empty. 
Well, according to the United Nations, more than 690 million of people will go to bed hungry today. We've made leaps and bounds in the world of science and nutrition, yet the world is vividly not on track to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with the worsening effects of climate change, the rising global population and the economic downturn in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Food and Agriculture Organization says that there is over 50,000 varieties of edible plants of which only three of them, rice, maize and wheat, provide 60% of the world's food. This situation is alarming, but if we take science back to our roots, we will find a treasure chest of underutilized, neglected species to enhance our food and nutrition security. These crops use fewer inputs and they are climate resilient. I'm a food scientist who believes in the value of underutilized crops in the pledge towards sustainable development for all. For instance, Mauritius is a net food importer and the pandemic has taught us that food insecurity is a real threat. I have developed a novel plant-based burger using local food resources, jackfruit, homegrown oyster mushroom, pumpkin seeds and farina kidney beans. The undried jackfruit fresh provides the meat-like fibrous texture and the seed is a potent source of starch to give compactness and structure of the burger. With the meat-like chewy sensation, oyster mushroom represent an attractive source of essential amino acids and have amazing antioxidant properties. The farina kidney beans are rich in zinc and iron to fight against anemia. And pumpkin seeds is a useful source of many nutrients essentials for humans. This future is in our hands. For the perfect combination of taste and nutrition, let's be really mindful of all the edible local underutilized crops around us for healthy and sustainable solutions that we have to pass on to the future generation and for a healthy planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pooja. A great talk and a great message as well. An important, very important topic. And moving on to the judges for the questions and starting this time with Dara, you have the floor. First of all, Pooja, uh, what a passionate uh, presentation there. Uh, and food is key to lots of our hearts. So this was uh, a great topic, I guess, to talk about. I wonder with, um, you know, you're talking about the reasons why maybe eating local foods um, can help with some of the problems on our planet. What would you say in one line is the key message that you want people to take from your presentation? Yes. I want people to aware that we have the global crisis is just next door. We've been talking uh, for decades and decades. So the global crisis is next door and we are all facing the food crisis, especially in Mauritius. So my takeaway message is really to start being mindful of what goes into your plate because these underutilized crops are really nutritious and we should give them a chance to serve us and they are waiting for us to be appreciate them. Thank you for that uh, message, Pooja. And uh, moving to Shini, if you have a question for Pooja. Well done, Pooja. That was such a fantastic presentation. I would like to know what the solution looks like. So would we, if, if I was to take a snapshot, a picture, what would the solution look like? Is it fields full of this crop you've developed? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've got your point. So my point is really because I have chosen the trendy uh, trend of burger culture in Mauritius. So I have used these underutilized crops to give value addition and I have developed this burger. So also, I'm, I'm also the strategy is to maybe use regenerative uh, agriculture, which means that the population is growing, but we can use the same land to produce more foods while also without sacrifice, sacrificing the forest and livestock. 
So we should not sacrifice these two, but also we should give them because in Mauritius, for instance, there is a lot of abundant land, and also like I've said, the oyster mushroom, the oyster mushroom can be grown in your home, in the garage, or for instance, even the jackfruit plant. The jackfruit, you can have the tree here for planting it for like it can be planted like it will take four to five years to be planted, but once it's there, the same the same tree will keep on giving you fruits for uh, after flowering and flowering and all of these like I have like my thing is that these underutilized crops have been there now for a long time so they are still surviving so if we just give them you know a bit of more research because research is really lacking in this field because we we have made research in all I will say fantastic brilliant aspect of science but I believe that science, science of food remain the basic science for vital in human. Thank you, uh, Shini. Uh, over for a quick question with Andrew. Thank you for that. I'm absolutely starving now. I'm a big fan of plant-based burgers and I really like to try one of yours. Um, what I was wondering was, why are these underutilized crops so underutilized? You know, why have things like rice come to dominate our global palate? And you know, therefore, what are the barriers, and what would you hope the research can achieve that can allow these crops to break through into slight, you know, into the mainstream? Yes, that's one of the very good question. You know, like I'm saying that we have known the best uh, yield, the how to plant, when to plant, the breeding system of these major crops, of these three major crops. Like we just need to get a bit of attention, more research, I will say, more research in terms of these underutilized plants. And also, like I'm saying, we just need to go with the trend. Like burger, I have given this as consumer analysis test and the, the consumers, they don't really aware of what goes into the burger, be it meat or uh, I would say chicken or something like that. But when they, I gave them this burger, so, it is tasty and it is nutrition. So it is a win-win game and also the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we are all seeing that the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting vulnerable person with a weak immune system. So these plants, they have the essential vitamins and minerals which is needed uh, for, to strengthen our immune system and then to increase our resistance to COVID-19. Thank you so much, Pooja, and thank you, judges, for your questions. I bet we are all now hungry and starving, as Andrew said. We need to actually like, test uh, your burger, Pooja, maybe next time. I will uh, invite you in Mauritius someday when I have my restaurant, maybe. <laughs> yes, we're just waiting for that invitation. Oh, please, nice. please let it come quick. <laughs> thank you so much, Pooja. And I would like just to remind uh, everyone to use the live chat to encourage all participants who are online with us uh, right now. Also remember, you will also get to choose your favorite participant to put through to the final. So bear that in mind uh, while you enjoy these amazing talks. Uh, let me introduce the next participant who is uh, a 26 year old master's student at Konkuk University from Korea. He majored in aerospace engineering and is now studying the flow of supersonic and hypersonic air vehicles. And that also sounds very fast. Uh, he feels happy by just talking about science. And he sees that as an opportunity to actually make the world a better place. I would like to welcome Hyung Wook from Korea. What is the most ideal aircraft in the world? A star tactical fighter? A helicopter? A drone? Whatever it may be, I'm sure most of you are thinking of aircraft with cutting-edge technology because most of them can fly very fast and many of them can fly very efficiently and sophisticatedly. But my opinion is a little bit different. I think the most ideal aircraft in the world is a dragonfly. You may think, really? A dragonfly? Then a cutting-edge aircraft worth tens of millions of dollars? Does it make sense? It doesn't. Then let me tell you why. The Dragonfly's flight is very light and nimble. Their flight trajectories are so fast and complicated that it's hard to track, hard to track with our eyes. Dragonflies have the ability that no aircraft on Earth can imitate. For example, hovering is of course possible, 
and it can explosively accelerate at 50 km per hour in a stationary state. And even in gusty weather, it has a stable flight posture to fly. And it can fly up, down, left, right, very quickly, anytime, anywhere. And even fly backward like the moonwalk. How is that possible? The secret lies in a different flight mechanism than a typical fixed wing aircraft. The fixed wing aircraft generates lift using the pressure difference caused by the difference in airflow velocity between the upper and lower wing surface. On the other hand, Dragon flies flap two pairs of wings at a large angle 30 times per second. So when, so when it flaps down, a leading edge vortex is created in front of the wing, and when it flaps up, this tiny tornado reattaches to the wing to make a circulation vortex and generate lift through it. Also, the front and rear wings cooperate with each other, which allows dragonflies to stay in the air more effectively. So now, do you agree that the dragonfly has mastered the art of flight? The reason why I talked about the dragonfly was not just to show off this toy model. When we talk about science, we say like, we have to keep going, we need to develop, but how? The key is here, a dragonfly made by nature. It's only been a little over a hundred years since we started looking to fly. Whereas, dragonflies have accumulated hundreds of millions of years of their flight know-how. Move your eyes to nature, then we'll be able to fly higher and faster into the future. Thank you. Great, great talk. Young Wook, thank you so much. And again, it's about nature. And as Young Wook said, move your eyes to nature. Starting with the questions right now for the judges. And this time, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, and great presentation. Um, I was wondering, how are we going to be able to translate these ideas that have been developed by the dragonfly into uh, you know, sort of vehicles for humans? And the thing that concerned me the most is when you said this thing could accelerate from zero to 50 kilometers an hour in a fraction of a second. I was thinking, you know, I don't get airsick in current planes, but I can well imagine in a plane that accelerated that quickly, I might not be feeling so well. So how can we try and translate the ideas from nature into something that we can actually use as human beings? Yeah, actually, uh, it's in terms of only or aerodynamic only, oh, we can make a, a little small dragonfly aircraft even right away. But uh, in order to grow in, a, uh, in, grow in size or fly, uh, fly, fly freely like a real dragonfly, then I think uh, we need to, a lot of, uh, a lot of research, research must be conducted in terms of structural mechanics or software engineering so, to, because to withstand the tens of flappings per second uh, they need to uh, any, uh, that requires tremendous intensity of the materials and it needs to very very great energy so also the natural aircraft like dragonflies uh, has a inherent flight stability that is what it what means is uh, uh it's it's difficult to implement uh, artificially implement this agility and this agility and neutral transmitter mechanism is very difficult so but maybe someday uh, we can make i think we someday we can make it so i don't know about uh, other fields but I think it will made someday because I think it's not a lack of technology that hinders the humans develop, but it's lack of uh, imag imagination. But we are imagining now, so yeah, I think like that. That's my opinion. Thank you so much um, uh, for your answer, Young Wook, and moving to Dara. Uh, so brilliant presentation um, and I think it's fascinating as well this idea that we can connect nature to our own engineering feats. Um, so you talked about the, the fact that the, you know, the dragonfly and we can look at that as modelling potential future aircrafts. Now I look at a plane and I see two wings and I understand you know perhaps we've taken that from wings of a bird. But um, can you tell us perhaps about any other engineering things on a spacecraft that have been taken from nature in terms of their design? Um, you mean 
uh, applied for space aircraft flight in only space field or any other various field? In any other kind of fields that you know of or your passion? Yeah, it's, it's very a lot of things in the world. Uh, for example, uh, have you ever worn a sports jacket or the hiking jacket? It's made of waterproof materials. And that waterproof materials is learned from nature and also uh, by by developing the nano optics measurement technologies we can see in that in very in detail very small things so we can learn the arrangement or, or structures of moleculars so that is very many applied for for us field in the world yeah Thank you so much, and we might have um, uh, some time for a very quick uh, one from Shini. That was a brilliant presentation and actually a subject that's very close to my heart as a fluid dynamicist. What I wanted to find out more about is when you were explaining exactly how the wings work together, um, is there an analogy that can describe how how the mechanism and the mechanism oh uh, yeah so first of all let's think about a normal fixed wing aircraft there's a wing and the wing has a thickness thickness called camber then that camber makes a uh, flow uh, the difference in airflow velocity between upper and lower wing surface but the insect wing like dragonfly's wing is very flat there's no thickness but as i said before the leading edge vortex created in front of wing and reattaches to the wing. And this tiny tornado, this vortex uh, acts like the acts like the thickness, the camber. So we can make a difference in airflow velocity upper and lower surface. And there is a circulation vortex. So thanks to this, the insects can fly very freely uh, even without any airflow from Ixter, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for the judges. Thank you, Hyongook, for that clarification. And uh, I'm, I'm, I can't uh, imagine we are already making it halfway through and going to the participant number six with all of the, those great talks till now. So um, let me introduce the next participant where I will start with the word sustainability because it's a key word nowadays and in different aspects. And one of, the, uh, one of those aspects is using sustainable methods for providing fresh products in urban environments. That leads us to indoor farming, where a company called Boom Grow is home for our next participants who work as a plan scientist there. Please welcome Daniel from Malaysia. What you see here might look like just a handful of dirt, a collection of sand, clay, and organic matter that makes up the topsoil of all our arable landmass. But more importantly, this is the starting point for almost everything that we eat. Every single grain of rice, fruit tree, fodder for our livestock begins its life here, growing with the support and the nutrients from dirt. But the problem is we might be running out. Now, half of the habitable land on earth is dedicated to agriculture, the production of food. And for decades now, this land has experienced the continuous application of inorganic fertilizers and pesticides, permanently altering the composition of the soil in terms of its salinity, the nutrients, ions, and minerals within the soil, as well as the microbiome, the fungi and bacteria native to the soil. Now this has led to the loss of millions of hectares of land, increasing every year, rendering them permanently and irreversibly altered, unable to support any growth of future crop. But yet the world's population continues to grow. And as that increases, so too does the number of people we need to feed. Now, currently, there have been two major approaches to this problem, both of which are quite horrible. Now, the first is simple. As farmers lose their current lands, they need to find more. And to do so, they resort to land clearing and deforestation. Thereby, we sacrifice our biodiversity and we accelerate climate change in an attempt to achieve food security. Now, secondly, is an increasing reliance on high salinity GMO crops. By doing so, 
we select plants that are sturdier and stronger and more resistant to harsh conditions. But as a result, now we are dependent on the monoculture of uh, identical clones, leaving our food security to a few companies and highly susceptible to outbreaks of disease. Now, it would be fair to ask, what actually do we do here? And I don't really know because there isn't a perfect answer. The high-tech solution involves hydroponics, uh, indoor agriculture, artificial intelligence, allowing us to really target the application of pesticides and fertilizers. But this is inaccessible to a majority of the world's farmers. It's too expensive. More holistically, we can look at organic farming. We can look at seasonal crop rotations, biological control agents. But organic farming doesn't match the yield of industrial agriculture. Now, socially, we should re-examine our relationship with our food system. Where does the food go to? Why is there so much waste in the way that we produce our food? And we can think more locally, buy and eat according to natural cycles of crop growth. Now, this is a difficult problem, but it's one that we really need to look at. We cannot take for granted that the soil we have here will always be available to us. We need to start acting now to conserve the land which supports our food and all our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that. I like how all of the talks have really strong messages in terms of to look to our nature. So going back, going to the judges and starting with Shini right now. Daniel, thank you so much for your presentation and opening my eyes to this very serious problem. How close are we to actually finding a solution? Well, we're very close in the sense that everyone's trying a lot of different things. But the trouble is that not everything works for everybody. Something that affects a farmer in Bangladesh who's facing soil salinity will not be the same as an almond farmer in California. So we're talking about different resources available to these people, as well as um, different problems like individually facing each farmer. So it's good that everyone's trying a lot of different things. And we'll, we'll get to the uh, approach there. I'm very uh, what's it, optimistic about how we're approaching this problem. Thank you, uh, Shini. Moving to Andrew. Hello. Yeah, I was wondering a bit more about sort of the origin of this problem, because to me it sort of sounds like if you've got a, a you know field full of crop and you're putting fertilizer on it, what, surely that fertilizer is injecting some nutrients into the soil at the same time as the crop's taking it out. So why is the soil quality becoming worse, even though we are adding those nutrients in? And in particular, you talked a lot about salinity, so like saltiness. Why is this process making the soil more salty? Ah, so the uh, nutrients that we're adding to the soil. Uh, follows a specific ratio depending on the kind of crops that uh, uh, are grown in the fields. But the rate of uptake according to each crop, uh, the ratios of nutrients being used are different. And it also depends on the weather patterns. So the amount of nutrients being leached out is uh, removed in different quantities. So over uh, many cycles of growing the same crop, we get uh, an imbalance in the nutrients accumulating in the soil. So you might get an increase in nitrates, phosphates, or potassium, depending on where you stay and what kind of crops are growing inside that particular soil. So it leads to, um, salinity just refers to the concentration of each particular mineral within each soil. So yeah, it's the uh, continual application of the same thing over and over and uh, just not changing the way that we've been doing agriculture all this while. So could we get partway to a solution by monitoring these different components of the soil and trying to then just top up the ones that are needed and not add any more if there's already too much of something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could. There's a lot of work now done in remote sensing, um, using satellite imagery or drone imagery to actually identify parts of fields which require fertilizer at that point in time. And so it's uh, possible to actually monitor how much you just need to eat uh, to add for that period of time or for that particular crop. But it's again, not really like uh, something uh, technology accessible to everyone. But uh, yeah, it's a good start. How can you tell from a drone or a satellite whether how much nitrogen there is in the soil? Oh, so um, it's hyperspectral imaging. They look at the amount of, um, they're looking at like, I don't know, infrared scans and the tomography of the soil and also like the downstream um, chemical reports that you like uh, use to corroborate with the uh, images from the drones. Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for the questions, Andrew, and for your answers. Uh, Daniel, moving on to Dara. Yeah, another brilliant talk. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. Um, I was just wondering, you know, we've got, a whole world, and I'm not saying this is a solution, but there is so much land mass. Is there any potential way of using bits of land that we we don't currently use for agriculture? Um, or what are the problems with the soil that's there that make it impossible for us to use that for growing crops and food? Uh, yeah, so or more than half of the land that we already inhabit is already used for agriculture. 
if we were to try and change lands that are currently not arable, like deserts or uh, Arctic uh, conditions, we would be like seriously altering the the natural value of those soils. Maybe they could be rainforests or deserts. They may be water reservoirs. So first of all, we would be seriously altering the natural value of these lands. And then also it's a huge amount of resources in trying to change land and make it arable. I would prefer if people just are more conservative with the agricultural land that we have now. It seems to be a better solution rather than going out and trying to convert something completely unarable into some place that we can plant. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, judges, and thank you so much, Daniel, for your uh, answers and for the great talk um, as well. Great. Um, you know, I remember the days where the maximum technology in a pair of shoes was to hear some music if I walk with them or to have some sort of light coming from the back of my shoe. That was, for me, for was stunning, absolute technology in my shoes. Currently, we are having a field of research specifically for footwear technology implementation. And this is the next participant's field of research, actually, uh, along with technology of uh, macromolecular uh, science. He's a master of arts, uh, of arts holder, a former ballet dancer, and currently doing his PhD. Please, please give your warm welcome to Aldrich from Czech Republic. Wiggle your toes. Come on, wiggle with me. Do you all feel your toes inside of your shoes? Well, every 10 person in this virtual auditorium cannot. Many years ago, I went for a ballet audition at the Czech National Ballet and I took a wrong oversized shoes. What a disappointment! But such was my longing, so I tried to lace up my shoes ever so tightly. I did not lose the shoes that day, but I lost the ability to feel my feet. And such a feeling is called neuropathy, and is described by diabetes-diagnosed people. They lose the ability to feel their feet every day. I'm curious. Is it the same feeling what even Cinderella had when she lost her shoe? Well, I'm not a Cinderella, but it was me who twisted the knee that day at a ballet audition after a fatal jump landing, so I couldn't become a dancer anymore. But because of that, I realized the importance of a footwear research. At first, I went to study a footwear design, when I received a call from my very good diabetes-diagnosed friend, who at the time went under a lower extremity amputation due to his battle with the diabetes food syndrome. Over one million Czech citizens are diagnosed with diabetes. That's 10 percent of the population. 70 thousands of them are battling with diabetes food syndrome, most of them already experiencing an amputation. This is horrific news, right? But the, the worst is that the wrong food were choice causes an amputation at four out of five cases. Zonal personalized footwear is a research combining an understanding of food biomechanics with a direct knowledge of 3D technologies. By using a 3D scanner and pressure plates, we are able to develop typologically suitable model of any type of shoes. We first 3D scan the patient's foot and then we create a virtual model of a shoe last. After that, the patient stands on or walk over a pressure plate thanks to which we can read the biomechanical transfer of weight and divide the food into many different zones that each has got a different distinct function. We apply this knowledge and create a unique membrane mechanism of an outsole and thereby give the people their life back. So I might not be a dancer anymore, but I can you I can let you dance into an old age. So you see, there is a happy ending after all. And now, where is my Cinderella? Thank you. It's a great uh, talk. Thank you so much, uh, Aldrich, and thank you for sharing such a personal story. 
but I'm glad that there's this um, happy ending to the story as well. So moving on to the judges with the questions and I'll start this time with Dara. Brilliant talk, thank you so much for that. Um, I guess one question I had is you're talking about people who suffer from a form of diabetes and that they could really do with some of the research that you're looking into. Are there any other applications or any other types of people that might be able to benefit from what you've been modelling? Definitely. This um, zonal personalised footwear, this research, uh, can create any type of shoe, which means we can also create a shoe for, for example, a sportsman uh, and their specific needs. Because we can create in the, in the shoe outsole, we can create uh, many different zones, either for dumping or rebound mechanism. So because of that, we can actually um, enhance the movement of the sportsman. But in our case, because my um, personal experience with my uncle and my friends, they already went on to an amputation, I'm focusing more on the diabetes because I can really see the feedback and uh, if it works or if it doesn't work. Great, thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Dara. Moving on to Shini. Brilliant talk. Um, you were treading a lot of ground there. Um, and I wanted to know if there's a connection between, uh, because you mentioned your dancing days and you mentioned diabetes, and it seems like your research has a lot of scope. And so I was wondering, um, what's the actual specific thing that you're looking at through your research? I actually, um put in, in the research, I take, um, because we can do specific uh, footwear for different food at one person. So for me, it's uh, thanks to the, I mean, the personality can be achieved by 3D technologies. If the shoe is made out of um, inject molding and such, it will never be personalized. It can be personalized with the insole, but the outsole can already have this structure. When some part can be more hard, than the other. And if you realize that after the, let's say, amputation of the toes, the part of the joints is not meant to be as the stepping part. So the muscles and the ligaments are not meant to get all the pressure. And for diabetic person, if they can get any blister or a shoe bite, it can last them for two months, three months before it's healing. And for, for us, for healthy people without the diabetes, it's about, let's say, one week only. So there are really, really big difference. So my input in that is uh, to do really a personalized food, uh, footwear, which can be applied for even um, each shoe at one person can be different. Because you see the footwear for one uh, leg with the amputation and for the other foot without the amputation or just uh, half up amputation can vary. So the inner structure and the membrane mechanism can change um, the well-being of the person who's walking in those shoes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we might have a quick one from Andrew. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question about um, to what extent do the, the sort of amazing high-tech soles you're designing, um, how do they work? Like what sort of materials are you using? What properties of those materials allow you to give people this extra benefit? Yeah, um, well, I'm doing, uh, we use uh, materials like thermoplastic polyurethanes or um, PIBA material. We collaborate with company Filamentum, which is a company direct, uh, based in Czech Republic. So we can travel to them. We are, they're actually next city from where I'm studying and it's fantastic. So, but because before I was focused only on design, now I can see that uh, the, even it might look the same, when I choose a different material, it can make a major dis uh, differences inside, in the structure. So I use flexible materials. Um, for, um, with, the, with the company, we even developed uh, a flexible material for the 3D printing uh, like three or four years ago. So I'm still co cooperating with this company for a filament uh, for 3D printing and uh, getting these filaments uh, which are more, most suitable for my purposes. Thank you, Aldrich, and thank you, uh, all of the judges, for your questions. Um, so right now, I'm just reminding you, we are now over halfway through uh, our event and our day, so I'm reminding you to keep thinking about who uh, would you give your uh, vote by the end. So, um, you know, usually people does 
does not want to go to the doctor. Um, I don't want to feel that feeling. And on top of that, going to the dentist. Uh, you want to resist the pain to the maximum before going there. But right now, the dentist is coming to us. She's now in the same warm weather I am at uh, with a behavioral neuroscience field of research and a hobby of writing articles. Um, but just to say, as a side note, this is a warning that the following presentation contains discussions that some, some viewers might uh, find upsetting. So right now, from the warm weather of Egypt, please give a warm welcome to Iman. I was brought up to think that if such things happened to me, I would fight them off. But I couldn't. I lost control. I was terrified and my body just shut down. Those were the words of an actual rape victim. That's one in five women in the US who experienced attempted or completed rape. And those who reported it were significantly lacking on core details. Now the question is, what is really happening inside the victim's brain? Sexual assault is a terrifying experience. And what is it in your brain that detects danger and mediates fear? That would be the amygdala, your alarm system, which right about now is going like and it's changing everything. It inspires a signaling cascade, which starts in your brain and ends up in flooding your bloodstream with adrenaline and cortisol, stress hormones. So elevating your blood pressure, raising circulation so that your body can be prepared to engage in survival reflexes. By the way, they're called reflexes because they don't involve any thinking. So ready to fight or fly or the lesser known freeze. Because we do actually tend to freeze for a while before we can flee or fight. But sometimes freeze is followed by even more freeze. That's involuntary paralysis called tonic immobility, which has been seen in many sexual assault victims. Huh, makes sense. Well, there's more. Now, this alarm is spreading the word and your brain is changing to cope with this stress. And among these changes is the release of norepinephrine. That's a neurochemical. And it should be good news for both your thinking brain in the prefrontal cortex and your memory center in the hippocampus. I mean, better reasoning, better decision-making, better memory, encoding, processing, and retrieval. No different rock. But too much stress, as in our case, leads to too much no different, and that is bad news because it activates a different type of norepinephric receptors in your thinking brain and memory center leading to the complete opposite results, meaning good reason, good decision-making, good memory, all down by now. So, freezing, fragmented memory, failing to act, don't seem so counterintuitive of the victim anymore. This is profoundly biological, and it might not happen to everyone, but it does to many. And if it happens to you, that's okay. Thank you so much, Iman, for this important and great talk. And now over to the, to the judges for some questions and starting now with Andrew. You have the floor. Wow, that's a, a hard talk to follow. Um, and I was wondering, obviously, that's a, you know, a sort of biological reaction. It's a terrifying thing. It can happen to all kinds of people in all kinds of stressful situations. Is there anything at all you can do to prepare or to you know, somehow try and hold on to those memories or not freeze up in that kind of situation that neuroscience can help us to work out? Uh, I just want to make sure that I understand your question right. You're asking, is there a way to uh, to make sure that this uh, freezing or uh, memory voids or whatever doesn't uh, uh, keep happening? To the exactly, or at least some, some way we can try and make it a bit better. Uh, well, sure. Uh, I'm not sure about rape, though, because rape is a very intense and horrifying experience. But uh, yes, brains are are trainable. And um, uh, I believe in, 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 in sexual assault experiences that that's, that's a very uh, broad spectrum of actions. But um, those, those including uh, unconsensual touches or uh, violations of different types, yeah, it, it is trainable. We, um, I'm speaking here from my personal experience. I used to freeze at first 
but now I hardly ever freeze. Yes, it is trainable, of course, but still I can't I can't say that about rape because I I honestly have no idea. This is this is this is pretty big. And how do you train yourself in that kind of situation? Because it just sounds very hard to imagine to me. Uh, well, um, I think it's it's all about, you know, the element of surprise. Um, well, rape as well is actually an experience that strangely um, happens when, when the perpetrator is someone that you uh, happen to know. It's an, it's, a, it's an acquaintance. So it's pretty much a, um, a surprising, not, not a pleasant surprise, of course. So this element of surprise makes the freeze very um, exaggerated, of course. Um, but when I'm talking about my own experience, um, well, I think it's it's about that I no longer am surprised in, in public space, you know, but that involves anticipating danger. And it's not it's not a cool thing, to be honest. And I hope it's not the case for all the other women who have trained themselves. But um, yeah, that, that, that's just my experience. Yeah, it sounds like quite a disappointing outcome if the only way that you can solve this is to no longer be surprised by it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andrew. And yeah, such an important um, uh, topic as well. So moving on to Shini, if you have a question for Iman. Iman, uh, what a powerful talk. Um, it's left me wanting to hear more about your research. Um, <clears throat> I have so many questions about your actual topic, um, which will probably take a long time to answer. So I'm going to stick with a basic, well, maybe not so basic question. What's the link between dentistry and your topic. Your topic. That's um, that's that's a cool question. In fact, uh, well, to be honest, um, dentistry has given me one tool that uh, enables me to make such a topic. That's that's the medical background. It just enables me to understand medical uh, terms and um, content. But um, I'm not uh, I'm not pretending to be a specialist here. But I do have the tool, and also I don't think of myself as such a terrible writer. So I have the tools for it, and I care enough to do it despite the difficulty. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shini, and over to Dara. Uh, so I just wanted to say again, um, what a yeah powerful talk that was. I just um, I wonder whether you know about the sort of um, kind of breakdown between how often people might go into flight or fight or freeze mode. So is it like a, you know, 50% of the time people are likely to freeze? And also, is there a difference between how men and women might respond in, in being put into a, a very kind of stressful situation like that? So um, is it, I want also to make sure I understand the question right. That's two questions. Um, the first part is uh, how often do we do each of which, right? And the other one um, is, is there a difference between men and women, right? Uh, well, how often do we do it? Um, I think, um, yeah, about women in, in rape, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty common. Freeze is the most common uh, reflex, but it's not it's not the only one, of course. Uh, but it is pretty um, prevalent um, in in many uh, cases. Given the element of surprise, giving the closeness of the danger, and um, you know, it's not only tonic immobility that's that's status of. Um, uh, of paralysis, there's only there's also collapsed immobility. That's when the victim loses consciousness. So there are pretty um, more than one way to respond to that. But yeah, um, freezing, uh, tonic immobility, collapsed immobility are the most prevailing in uh, in women. Um, is there a difference between men and women? Well, um, because women are the um, that's the gender that's most um, uh, most uh, sexual abuse and uh, uh, and rape happens for. Uh, that's it, it's more you know it's more studied in them. It's more seen in them. So um, it's safe to say that yeah they do. It happens more often to them. But we don't, we don't know if that's different between men and women. But we don't we don't um, we, I can't say it's different. There isn't there isn't something that. Um, uh, you know, affirms such assumption. Why would it be different? It's a biological response. Um, and the element of surprise is the same. You know, if a man doesn't anticipate it, yeah, it's, it's most probably he will freeze uh, too. Uh, but there are many other uh, parameters, you know, how dangerous the perpetrator is. Is he armed? Uh, can, I, can I fight back? These are things that might also affect 
how your body uh, responds to it, um, and also some social parameters that um, that might might affect that. So I can say for sure if it's definitely that men fight better or or will respond better, but yeah, it, there are many confoundings here. Thank you so much, Iman, for your answers and judges for your uh, questions on that uh, important and great topic. And moving on now to the next uh, participant. Um, he has just defended his PhD thesis about the world of genetics and how we can understand uh, human diseases by studying our DNA. He's a cinema lover and a good reader as well, which fosters his love of stories and is finding happiness in mixing his love of stories with that, with science. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Jesus from Spain. See the Northern Lights. Check. Swim with dolphins. Check. Write a book. That was a tough one. Check. Five years, 40,000 words in a journey within ourselves and attending apathy at the very end. That is, ladies and gentlemen, the summary of my PhD in which I've tried to crack the most important code in biology, our DNA. Within each and every cell, the genetic information is contained in the DNA, a lone code such as this rope. With our sheet music that will set our biological pace and will give the instructions of what needs to be done. In the DNA, we can find the genes, here highlighted in red. And we humans have more than 20,000 of these genes with this specific information that defines our features from eye color to genetic diseases. However, all of these genes occupy less than 2% of our total DNA. What happens with the 98% left? What is all this information for? Although 98% of the DNA, the 98% of the DNA is the great unknown, we do know that it contains regulatory regions that control genes. And genes are like instruments in an orchestra. And there are different types of genes, just like there are different types of instruments. But every orchestra needs coordination. Regulatory regions are going to tell genes how, when, and where to play. They are the two directors of the orchestra. Because even though every single cell in an organism has the same genetic information, the same DNA, a neuron in our brain does not need the same instructions as the muscle in our heart. The genes, the instruments are the same. But the music they play, that's completely different. During my PhD, I have dived into this unknown code, searching for regulatory regions that are involved in cardiovascular diseases. Fascinating, right? Sure, but we need to take into account that we're talking about DNA, a code that in humans has more than 3 billion letters, which means that finding regulatory regions here is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Thanks to our research, we have found new regulatory regions that are essential because they make sure that the genes that control our heartbeat, they work properly. It turns out that as it happens in a concert where the wrong note might break the heart of our beloved orchestra director. Alterations in these regulatory regions that we've discovered cause arrhythmia, affecting the pace of our heart. And knowing these genetic alterations is key because it will allow us to improve patient diagnosis and develop new therapies. Thus, genetics is the substance we're all made of. It is the pentagram on which the melody of the genes is written. So let's tune our instruments thoroughly and enjoy the concert. Thank you so much, uh, Jesus. We are enjoying the concert and enjoying the, the event. So I'm assuring you we, this is uh, happening. Thank you so much for the great talk. And now over to the judges with the questions and starting with Shini. Thank you so much. That was so fascinating. Um, and it seems like for your research, there's just so much work to do. But what has your research got in store for the future? Like, where is this all heading? Yeah. So basically, uh, in my research, what we have found is uh, ex uh, looking into these woods, no? into this uh, great amount of DNA, some places that are really important to control gene expression. So genes uh, were thought to be just uh, 
trumpets that were playing all by themselves. But we now know that there are these regulatory regions that actually let them know and tell them what to do and where to do it. Now what we are doing is to generate animal models that lack in these elements that we found that they are important. So now the genes are going to be behaving in a different way, in a different way. We still have the trumpet and the drums, but now they don't really know where to play. So now that's what we are looking into and we want to know uh, what are the effects and the consequences of this so we can screen in the future people to look for these mutations and assume or look uh, follow up for these symptoms that we are studying. Fascinating. Thank you. Great, thank you. And over now to Dara. Uh, so thank you, Jesus. I really enjoyed that. Um, it was like a melody of a presentation. Um, I really liked the analogy that you used of this orchestra and the instruments. And it was like throughout your presentation, I wonder why did you choose to use that analogy where you could have used something like, I don't know, chef using different ingredients to create a, a, you know, a dish or a masterpiece. Why is it that you decided to use the analogy of an orchestra? So first of all, um, so I want to say two things. So uh, genetics is sometimes compared to a book, like uh, to stories or to uh, being able to modify the DNA the same way that you are highlighting a text or something like that. But for me, music is more, uh, it's not visual, of course, it's more like evocative. No? So I, I feel that everyone can follow me. And also because I know nothing about music. So if I, I, thought I was using this analogy uh, and I'm very sure that everyone can follow me because I'm not an expert. I don't know how to play an instrument and I still can do these comparisons. And because the example is so easy and we have it in our memory, in our, in, in our minds, even though we're not expert, uh, that allows me to go to move back and forth with my story with not, without losing my audience because you know, I go back to the instruments and you're like, okay, whatever they are called, if they are genes or regulatory regions, but the instruments and not the director of the orchestra. So that's why I chose this analogy. Thank you so much. And Andrew? I guess this session, I'm going to come across like I'm someone who's obsessed with genetic engineering. But what I was wondering was, what kinds of changes are there in these uh, regulatory regions you're talking about? And could we go in and potentially change them and, you know, fix people's hearts? So that's much way much more difficult than that so at the moment we are not um looking into treatment right now like it's my research uh, aims for um, improved diagnosis still like yet um because cardiovascular diseases are so complex they are called polygenic because there are many genes involved in these diseases so it's not a one like a, a, a single mutation or like a single change in the DNA that is going to cause the mutation. It's uh, that will increase the risk of suffering from for the disease, but it doesn't assure that it is uh, going to produce or generate a disease. So there are many, many mutations. Uh, right now, there are like more than 100 and none of them uh, leads like 100% to the disease. So, but if we collect and we can have uh, like a storage, like a, a, a file with all those 100 mutation. And we can check and screen people to do that. We can follow them up closely and diagnose the disease earlier and start treatment earlier. And then the, if that it's successfully done, then we can move towards improving treatment or, or any other thing. But uh, changing DNA in, in, in patients is not like the way to go with this kind of diseases. Thank you. Thank you so much, judges, for the questions. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your answers and for the great talk. Um, um, we enjoyed it. So uh, right now we are uh, almost going uh, to, the, to the last bits of our day with the participant. Next participant is the number 10 out of 12. And let me tell you that there are two words that are really booming nowadays, startups and entrepreneurship. Those words are booming, are trending, and that is the field of research for our next participant. Uh, he's working as a COO for an organization called uh, Lombris, and he's also got to the semifinals through the FameLab Climate Change Communicators, uh, which was an online special edition of FameLab. 
So we shall travel now virtually and travel from Europe to the Americas, to specifically to Mexico, and give a warm welcome to Danny. What if I told you I was playing with earthworm poop? Most of you are probably thinking, gross. Well, our plants, crops, our food, the planet thinks is the most beautiful poop in the world. Charles Darwin said, without a doubt, the earthworm is the most important creature in history. We hear about the bees, reforestation, recycling plastic, all extremely important topics for sustainability. But we forget that just a few centimeters below the ground lives an incredible creature that produces an amazing organic material that we call vermin cast or earthworm poop with an A to Z list of benefits. Like, do you know that vermin cast can regenerate our soils? Did you know that its porous nature can absorb more water preventing flooding like in agriculture? And talking about agriculture, vermin cast in soils brings rich biodiversity and nutrients to help in production, quality in crops, and can even prevent certain diseases and plagues. Charles Darwin was right. Earthworms literally move the earth. And when it comes to climate change uh, and global solutions, we need to have earthworms part of the discussion. They need to be a top priority for us. For example, we are losing 24 billion tons of fertile soil each year. Soils, by the way, which feeds our population. And I believe one of the reasons is because we've taken earthworms out of the equation. And I believe with all these losses that we have year after year, we're heading toward a major food crisis. But guess what? Earthworms are standing by and they're ready to help and produce this incredible organic material. And how can we do that? Well, simply by just giving them our organics to eat. I want you to think about that for just a moment and how simple that action is. But that is our greatest challenge today and what my colleagues and I are currently working on to get more homes, businesses, and industries to stop throwing billions of tons of organics in the garbage and throwing into our smart vermin composters. How are we gonna accomplish this? Well, with the creativity of entrepreneurship and its, well, rule-breaking mentality, collaborating with vermin composting science with its hard data and algorithms, we are dealing with the most sophisticated fertilizer machine in the world. And if we can have scientists and entrepreneurs working together, then we can build a nature-based solution with digital innovation to mass produce vermin cast worldwide by simply recycling our organics with an animal that potentially sleeps only one hour a day and works 365 days a year for free. I'm Danny Daniels and I speak for the worms. I know a lot of us think that they're ugly and simply small and insignificant, but the truth is, is they can have such a massive positive impact on our environment that we can decrease garbage contamination in our dumps contamination in our air, water, and soil, bring rich nutrients back into the earth and consequently back into our bodies. See, I'm beginning to think you guys are starting to understand why Charles Darwin also said that the earthworm is more powerful than the African elephant and more important to the economy than the cow. And that's why I say earthworm poop is not gross, but the one that you and I need the most. Thank you. Well done, Danny. Great talk. Thank you so much for that. I'm happy that the worms are having someone now to talk on behalf of them and to, to, to have their voice uh, heard around the globe. Uh, so now moving on to the judges and starting uh, this time with Dara. A firstly, fantastic talk. Um, I never knew earthworms were the, the super worker of the earth, but that's really interesting to know. Um, I think the question I had, and forgive me if I've gotten the wrong end of the stick here or you've kind of clarified it already, but earthworms are in the soil. Why is it that we need to be taking our compost or at least providing it to this um, vermin com composting science research rather than just sending it to our general garbage kind of area where it will, it will be put into the soil anyway? Okay, so that's a fantastic question. We do not want organics in garbage dumps because the amount of em emissions that, uh, it, that it gives, it's actually contaminating. Organics, that's why I don't say organic waste, I say organic remains because it's not garbage. So what we're doing in the project that we're doing is we don't want people, for example, I don't wanna see this to go into the garbage dump. And so when people are done eating this in their homes or in a restaurant or in a cafeteria in a building, Instead of putting it in the garbage dump, we just put it right into our smart vermin composter that we've developed where the earthworms are sitting and they'll start eating this and they'll develop it into the best organic fertilizer in the world. 
That's why we need to do it that way. Very nice. Thank you so much, Danny and uh, Dara. And moving to Andrew. My question is, you mentioned algorithms, and the only sort of computer worms I've heard of tend to be quite bad news. So I was wondering if you could expand a bit on how we can use algorithms to help the worms generate the sort of best organic matter. How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, it's beautiful. That's a great question. It's, or, it's earth from science. It comes down to numbers, calculations, and patterns. So our smart vermin composter is built precisely. We like to, we joke around with our clients, but we say we want to create a spa for our earthworms because we want them to do three things. And they do these three things really well. We want them to eat, we want them to reproduce, and we want them to make the most beautiful poop in the world. And so putting all this technology and all these uh, uh, numbers, for example, pH levels, temperatures, humidity, putting this all together so that they can do those three things all the time without abusing them, because it's very important to us. We wanna collaborate with earthworms. We don't want to exploit them in any way. So using all of that, um, we're able to, yeah, be able to, to create an incredible environment uh, to produce this incredible organic material that we want to put back into the fields, into agriculture, so that we can start regenerating uh, our, our soils again and putting nutrients back in our food again. It just, there's just, the, the list, it go, it's endless of the benefits that the earthworms can do for us. And how actually do you optimize those things? Like how do I, if I've got my composter at home, how do you optimize the pH and the temperature in that place? I mean, I guess the temperature you can just have a heater, but the pH, you know, do you tell me to chuck different things in there? Do you have special acid and alkali sprays? Like, what do you do? Well, for example, Andrew, you don't want those flies on your nose, right? And that's one of the things that that uh, compo like composting can do. We all know we don't like flies, right? So that's another thing that we were focused on, right? How to uh, mitigate like all these type of things. So how do we do it? You actually don't do anything. We atomize everything. So for example, if it's not humid enough, we actually have things that, we'll actually have sprayers. So you will have a platform. So you, there'll be a digital platform. You'll actually see what your pH levels are, what your humidity level is, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the system itself will make sure and maintain that system. So you actually don't do anything. The only thing that we ask our clients is that you just take this, and this is why we say it's such a simple action and such a small change in our lives, instead of throwing this in the garbage can, you just throw it into this machine and it's gonna do everything for you. Thank you so much. And uh, moving on for a quick one by Shini. Danny, that was so awesome. I love listening to you. Um, why hasn't this technology been adopted sooner? Oh, gosh, that is the question of all questions. I don't know. That's, that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. But if I had to take a guess, I think one of our biggest problems today is that we think climate change or global warming is such a big problem that we need big solutions. And that cannot be further from the truth. I think a lot of my scientists here can agree that some of the smallest things in the universe are actually most powerful and impactful. And so, DNA, for example, we we're discussing that earlier. Um, and the earthworm is a great example. It's this little creature that lives just a few centimeters below the ground and the impact that it can have on our planet. Not only is it massive, but it's quick. Because when you put vermin cast into the soil, it begins to immediately start regenerating the soil again. So our whole concept and our idea is that we're not worried about big ideas and big solutions. We are, we're making the little guys the unspoken heroes, as you would might want to say it, giving them, yeah, finally a spot on the table to say, listen, these guys can do something and we can do it in small scale just inside of people's homes and that impact will be massive. In Puebla, in Mexico, we right now we're planning to have 30,000 homes using this technology. So just imagine 30,000 homes not throwing this into the garbage every single day. That small act, that small little change in 30,000 homes produces an, a, a massive impact for us. And that's what we want to create. So short answer, no idea, but here we are and, and, we're, gonna, and we're, we're representing the worms. Thank you so much, uh, judges. And thank you so much, Danny. And I might be quoting your sen uh, statement, the most beautiful poop ever. That would be your next 
title or your next presentation's title, or it could be a headline for a, for a very interesting uh, article in a science magazine. I really like the statement itself. So thank you for that, and thank you for the energy uh, you gave us. Um, moving on to the next participant, but before doing so, I want you all to imagine with me right now as if you are in a, on a fine day of summer on the beach, ordering, ordering your pina colada cocktail. There are several fruits in there, but forming a beautiful cocktail together. Imagine that. This is exactly what came to my mind when I read about the next participant, where she said a lot about her passions. She's passionate about science communication, obviously, she's here with us today. Passionate about arts, reading, music composition, hiking, and gardening as well. So it's a nice cocktail of passions as well. So please give a warm welcome to Tammy from Ireland. I'm on a plane. It's pre-COVID, so I'm wearing a different type of mask. I'm on a long haul flight. It's about, um, it's going through several different time zones. It's going east. I'm about 10 hours into a 14 hour flight. As far as I'm aware, it's nighttime because you see it's cold in the cabin and it's dark as well and I'm really hoping I don't get jet lag and I can feel my suprachiasmatic nucleus in my brain. My master clock is telling me you have to sleep. And the melatonin and my adenosine levels are rising and telling me and pushing me into that lovely state of unconsciousness when suddenly I bolt awake because I'm starting to think, what about the pilots? How are they meant to operate a plane with a 10 hour shift and no sleep? If I'm sitting here struggling to read my book in my seat, then how, how are they all going to manage in the cockpit? Because you see, sleep is an essential part of our neurocognition and we're all aware of this. Think of the last time you had a sleepless night. It, how did you feel? Not good, I bet. See, sleep is usually thought of this state of relaxation. It's thought of this power down mode where our, our heart slows down, our breathing slows down. We lose consciousness and yet our brain is actually super active during this time because we enter into this cyclical homeostatic program where our memories are consolidated, our immune cells are activated and critically our brain wastes are drained away. Now these brain wastes are these products of the very active metabolism that occurs during the day during cognition. So we produce things like carbon dioxide and lots of proteins that are just left in the extracellular spaces in the brain. And during sleep, particularly during deep sleep, a wave of fluid tends to push back into the systemic circulation, clearing away those wastes and allowing us to feel refreshed in the morning. Now this is called the glymphatic system and it's only been discovered in the last 10 years. It follows a very strict circadian rhythm and it only occurs during long periods of deep sleep. And without it, we seriously struggle. Without it, we, we are at risk of developing things like anxiety and depression. Now, shift workers are experts in this region because despite pilots and doctors and new parents trying to slip in naps to catch up on lost sleep, they do not benefit from this brain waste drainage system because it doesn't work during nap time. And to be at your best cognitively, you do need regular long periods of sleep. And as I'm in my seat again, I'm thinking I'm worrying about the pilot because in 2019, a study showed that pilots make an increased number of calculation errors when on shift and sleep deprived. And yet I'm still in my seat, still falling asleep because despite the fact that this is a potentially dangerous situation, it's remarkably common that we rely on people being sleepless and working anyway to support certain industries. And this is something that has to change. Thank you so much, Tammy, for the great uh, talk and the great example. Actually, I didn't think about it. Uh, next time, I, I probably would be terrified to sleep <laughs> in the airplane. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for that. And over to the judges. And right now, uh, let's start with Andrew. I mean, what I'm obviously looking for after that talk is sleep tips. Like, how much sleep do I need to be getting? How do I make sure I get that deep sleep? Like, what's the, what's the best practice from your point of view? 
That's a great, great question. So ideally as an adult, you're looking to get over six hours, so between six to eight hours per night. Sometimes that can vary per person, but if you want to benefit from the thing that I mentioned, the lymphatic system, then usually it's six to eight hours. And in order to put yourself in that scenario, you kind of need to, like the way I did in my cabin scenario, you have to put yourself in a certain level of darkness. You have to put yourself in a quiet place and avoid light because light will not allow you to build up melatonin and get you to go asleep. So you need that darkness and that you know, stay away from your phone essentially in the evening time. So the glymphatic system is like super slow. How long does it take to sort of spin up and get going? So it doesn't, and none of it happens during the day. This is what's so interesting is that it's such a, it's a really major circadian rhythm kind of process. So when you get into kind of the nighttime zone, um, you need that six to eight hours for it to cycle. And it, as I say, it cycles a couple of times during the night. It occurs in waves. It's beautiful. There's some really beautiful studies where it's been shown on electron microscopy where you can see the labeling of the fluids as they push through. And again, it only occurs at night. But yes, during the six to eight hours that you should be sleeping, that's when it occurs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew. And moving on to Dara. Um, firstly, a fascinating talk. I think we all love our sleep and we'll be making sure that we get enough of it now. Um, you talked about the end, you know, people working shifts have a, a harder time with this. I mean, I can't imagine a society where we all function during the day and we're all sleeping, you know, sort of at night. So what do people who are shift workers, what's the best thing for them to make sure that they do get enough sleep? Some people are actually really good at this. So, for example, I was wearing a sleep mask instead of my COVID mask. I was wearing a sleep mask. So some people will um, take certain habits into practice, like when they're working shift, they will have earplugs. They will have be able to but essentially what you're trying to do is block out the natural cues from the external world that prompt you to want to sleep. So covering sound, co uh, blocking out light that will push you to not produce the hormones that drive sleep. And a lot of people in the, who are shift workers are very experienced at doing that. It's just some people are better at it than others. Some people are at increased risk for developing the kind of disorders of sleep anyway. So it really depends on the person who will kind of do well in these scenarios. Um, I, I suppose it's, it's, it's kind of an occupational hazard, but yeah, it, some people are better at preventing kind of problems than others. Thank you, Tammy, for those uh, tips. And thank you, Dara. And now moving on to Shini. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, that's got me really thinking. Um, and I guess what I'd like to know is what is the specific objective of your research? Oh, I'd love to talk about that. So um, I mentioned that there's certain neurological conditions, including anxiety and depression, that are driven by circadian rhythm disruptions. And that's been established for many years. But my research is actually about how circadian rhythms impact other conditions, including epilepsy. So epilepsy has been shown to have a circadian rhythm uh, kind of uh, an influence for in the medical literature for for hundreds and hundreds of years but people don't understand why at the molecular level why does that happen and we think that if we could disrupt that circadian element because circadian rhythms are driven by very core molecular clocks if we could kind of disrupt that in some way or manipulate it that we could come up with new therapies because unfortunately a third of people with epilepsy don't respond to any treatments at the moment and yet there's a circadian rhythm po component that's been unexplored that's my my research Thank you, Shini, for the question. Thank you so much, Tammy, for the answers and for your um, uh, talk. We really um, enjoyed it. Um, we're just approaching or we're, we're arriving to the final talk of our day. And I'm sad to say the final talk because I was really enjoying every part of it. So the last participant is working in a field of research that I personally find it very important, which is molecular uh, biology and cancer research. Uh, she's a PhD student in the School of uh, Vet uh, Veterinary uh, Medicine uh, in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And her full name is different from her nickname. So let me welcome Hara from Greece with a preferred nickname, Joyce. Breaking news. New COVID-19 measures have been announced. Good news. Starting today, Joy vaccines will be available for everyone at no cost. Unbelievable! Let's go live and speak to our correspondent, Afaloniati Kara, which by the way in Greek means joy, sees in the brain now for us. Hi, we're here in the brain, or as you can see, it's more like a jungle. I can barely walk. All these trees, oh my god, are neural cells. They have the branches, the dendrites to teach and <coughs> communicate with each other and a tall core the action 
for the long distance calls. The key of happiness is here, yep, inside your brain, particularly into the hormone stick. Today, the MVP player, Miss Serotonin, is here for us. So, Serotonin, what's your job here? How can you make us happy? Hi, and thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited. Well, my job, uh, my life here sucks. The email still hasn't been discovered here. So, in order for the neural cells to communicate, because as you can see, there's a gap between them, the synaptic plug, they still send letters, and we are the postwoman. We take the information from one step to pass it just two steps further away onto the other. That's why we have the nickname Neurotransmitters. Okay, the truth is that I carry the whole thing because I'm the equalizer of your emotions. No serotonin, better go cry. Hi serotonin, you're the happiest person in the world! So, to sum up, did you wake up this morning feeling a little blue? Tear yourself up by eating something rich in serotonin. <laughs> You're missing something though. Well, when you eat me, I walk all the way up to your brain to start work straight away. But the doorman never lets me in. Your brain has a nightclub bouncer, the blood brain barrier, bodyguard for its protection, and the placer is mother like me is not allowed. Luckily for you, your brain can make serotonin by itself. Shh. And here is the secret. Your brain just needs the first version of me, the tryptophan. No matter how smart your brain is, it can so not synthesize tryptophan. So, wanna be happy? Eat foods rich in tryptophan. Like chicken, turkey, tuna, milk, are you vegan? Old milk, chocolate, duck. Otherwise, you're gonna be terrible with some mistakes. Sadadon, thank you so much for joining us today. So, Joy Vaccines, did you get your first shot? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hara, for, for, for that. And thank you for keeping all of that energy till the end of the day. That's, that's in itself a great effort. So say thank you for that. And also, I wish my brain just contains all of those happy smiles all of the time. That's, that's exciting. So uh, over to the judges and this time starting with Shini. Wow, that was so entertaining. Thank you so much. Um, can you just clarify for me what the connection is between vaccines and uh, serotonin? Yeah, actually, it was a metaphor. <laughs> so, joy vaccines, because now we have COVID-19 and we have to take vaccines. So, inside here is chicken, uh, oatmeal, turkey, whatever you like that has tryptophan, because tryptophan then is uh, become serotonin. So, and serotonin makes you happy. So, that's the connection with the vaccines. It is not really a vaccine with tryptophan or with serotonin. I was going to say, I, I really want a shot of that, whatever it is. Well done. That was brilliant. Yeah, I guess we all will need that shot, Shini. No, no, not only one shot, like uh, continuous shots of that. So uh, moving now to Andrew. I was just wondering, how does this connect to your research? Are you interested in the diet side of this or you know, sort of the molecular biology of what the serotonin does in the brain? How does, how does yeah, your research connect to what you just talked about? Okay, it is totally irrelevant. It has nothing to do. But during the pandemic, I felt sad sometimes and uh, I was reading about how to uh, boost my, my, my mood and uh, I read a little about serotonin so I made some uh, slightly uh, changes in my diet and I put more tryptophan and helped me to, to be more happy and to do my PhD and my research, that's the connection. <laughs> That's great. And you fully anticipated my follow up question. You can just see the, the scientific curiosity there. Whenever a scientist is sad, they don't, you know, buy a load of balloons or something. They go and read some papers and work out what they can eat to make them happier. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. And finishing the questions with Daya. Yeah, what a way to, to end the different presentations we've seen. It was very, very uh, entertaining. Um, I think my question is, you know, you've mentioned food contains this chemical, which then is converted to serotonin in the body. Is there any other way of increasing the serotonin levels in your body um, through, you know, physical acts that we do or anything else that we might consume? What are some of the other ways that we might be able to make ourselves happy? 
Okay, for serotonin, you should definitely need tryptophan because tryptophan then begins serotonin. But you can increase the release of serotonin if there is, of course, a tryptophan when you exercise yourself, when you have good sleep, or when you take more sunlight. <laughs> That's the other ways. Thank you so much, judges, for the questions, and thank you, Hara, for your answers. And wow, what a semi final! Diverse talks, cultures, talents, and for sure, eye opening talks. Words cannot describe how we appreciate the, the role that our judges did. It's a, it's a tough task for them to choose four participants who will continue to the finals. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for our fantastic judges. And now it's over to you as well, the audience vote, because the voting is now open. Follow the link below or in the chat to vote for your favorite participant to have a place in the final two. And I'm reminding you to try and not to choose just your friend. You will need to select your top three. Then you will need to rank them with number one being your favorite. You will have 24 hours to get your vote in. Then tune in next Tuesday to find out who is through to the grand final. For now though, I will leave you with a reminder of the fantastic talks that we have seen today. Thank you for joining us. I enjoyed it so much, hope you also did, and now go and vote.